Hey, Dean Lushniak, how are you? Hi, Kelly, how are you today? Good, good. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm really excited for this episode because there are so many questions about going back to school. And a lot of, of information that still needs to flow out there. Uh, so, um, yeah, you know, things are happening. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of movement on COVID-19, um, you know, nationwide right now. And, and certainly we're at the university trying to react to all this brand new information. So uh, things are changing. Yeah. I, I'm, well, thank you everyone for joining this session too. We have a lot of people on very quickly. Um, and thank you everyone who joined our last session, which was a month ago now. Um, and that was a really great panel and everyone asked so many thoughtful questions and I'm so sorry we didn't get to go through all of them. Um, but just going forward with today, please feel free to leave as many questions and as they appear at the bottom, we should be able to answer them in real time and then also we'll plan to have 15 minutes at the end to go through them. Um, but just, I guess, going through what we're going to talk about today, it's kind of the elephant in the room, what, like, the go-to question that all of our friends and family members are asking if we're returning to campus in the fall and how we're going to be able to do it and what's going to be happening with classes and hanging out with friends and everything. And UMD sent a, an initial email to students regarding housing and return to campus plans. Um, and I think their second email was supposed to come out this week. And we're really lucky that UMD has so many public health professionals that are sitting on these committees to help plan and just voice their knowledge about the situation and bring a new perspective, not just their traditional administrators making these decisions. Um, but today we're gonna talk about what UMD plans to do in the fall semester, and then also answer any questions related to the university plans and how this might impact students. Um, so, Dean Leshniak, I know we usually start off by you giving a brief overview. I feel like so much has changed in the past month. So if you want to just give a few highlights about the current situation we're in, that would be much appreciated. Good. So, yeah, let's start out like we traditionally do is looking at where we're at with COVID-19 as a pandemic. Uh, and, and then we'll spend a lot of time today talking about the University of Maryland and the College Park community in particular. So right now, and I'm looking at the latest numbers coming in from the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center site. That's my go-to place. So for everybody listening out there, if you want to see the latest data, uh, incredible analyses, incredible statistics, a lot of depth there. Uh, it's uh, become sort of the, the, the cornerstone of information uh, based out of Johns Hopkins, uh, their University of Medicine, and specifically the Coronavirus Research Center. So Google that. Uh, right now, worldwide, we've uh, gotten up to 13.3 million people uh, who are test uh, total confirmed uh, cases of COVID-19, the disease, uh, who are infected by SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus. So that's sort of a way of introducing lexicon and terminology into, into this. Uh, of that, we have uh, 579,000 people who have died. Uh, and and the, the reality is that in the midst of all this, let's reflect on this, is that number one, um, this is still a disease that affects a lot of people. Uh, it, it's a disease that kills people. If we look at the crude mortality rate, and this is not the actual mortality rate because we, right now don't know how many people are out there who have not been diagnosed as yet. But if you do the simple mathematics, it's four to 5% is where we've been at. So four to 5% individuals who have gotten COVID-19 die from the disease. Uh, so that's you know an incredible tragedy that's taken place uh, worldwide. In the United States, we remain the epicenter of activity. It, it's us and Brazil, uh, and then India, Russia, Peru, Chile, and Mexico. So those are the five top countries uh, in the world, or six, seven top countries in the world, who right now have uh, the, the largest number of cases. Uh, 
And uh, in the United States, we've just surpassed 136,000 people who have died from COVID-19. Uh, last time we had this show, I think we were perhaps a little bit more optimistic, and I still remain optimistic, but I am also have to share the realist uh, aspect of this, is that uh, we maybe were thinking, and this was one of the questions that we've had in the past, is if we get to summertime, are we going to see a lull in the action? And I'll emphasize with our audience out there today that coronavirus is brand new. This is a novel virus. We've never dealt with this virus before. What we've seen in past epidemics with influenza, there's been summer lulls in the past with influenza. And I guess a lot of us were hoping that we would see a bottoming out of the number of people with coronavirus as a result of heat and humidity and perhaps people getting outdoors. And in fact, in the United States, we've not seen that. What we've seen is a increase and then we started decreasing, and that's exactly what happened to Europe two to four weeks ahead of us, an increase and then a decrease. The difference between us and the European Union was the European Union continued down and then started flattening out, and we continued down and then stopped and plateaued much higher above European Union. And the reason we do that comparison is that population-wise, the European Union is about the size of the United States. And then what we've done is we started increasing again. And, and, you know, that's not a good place to be at this stage of the pandemic. We know, and if you've been following the press, the hotspots right now are Florida, uh, are Texas, Arizona, and California. But lately, 15 to 20 states have been seeing increases. So this is not going to be one of those diseases that gets better in the summertime. Uh, and we're not at a good place right now in terms of trying to control this disease at the community setting. So I'm going to throw in the optimism. At the same day, so this past Sunday, uh, Florida broke for, for the first time the record of number of people who were diagnosed with corona, uh, uh, COVID-19 in a single day. And that was, I think, over 15,000 people diagnosed. Uh, which isn't good. But on that same day was the first time in a long time that we actually saw zero, zero deaths in New York City from COVID-19. And we remember what a tragedy New York had been just a few short months ago. So that's the optimism is that is, are we going to be seeing these hot spots and are we going to be seeing the both death rates go up and a number of cases go up nationwide? Uh, unless we do something about it. And I think the real problem that we've seen is that we started opening up, right? We started opening up the world around mm -hmm. us. We started congregating in larger groups. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and that's been a problem. Now, when we talk about the middle Atlantic states, specifically Virginia and Maryland, this is where we start talking about local scenarios. Uh, and you look into the Northeast, that part of the country is actually doing pretty well. Uh, we're starting to see a few slight increases over the last few days, but compared to lots of other places in the United States, we're doing pretty well. And, you know, part of this could be, and certainly around the Washington, D.C. area, Prince George's County, where College Park is located, Montgomery County, where I live, and, you know, a lot of suburban counties around in Virginia, all have been pretty disciplined, I'd say, in terms of their approaches to COVID-19. We here in Montgomery County are still in the phase two, right? We've not opened up everything as yet. Uh, people are wearing masks indoors in many business establishments. And I think there is this respect towards the idea of the six foot rule and physical distancing. So that is the hope is that somehow we take this a little bit more seriously than we have. And that many of the states, as you've seen, even you know, Florida, who had been staunchly against the use of masks and from a governor's perspective, Texas, they're all looking at this idea as maybe that's the answer is that we're going to have to instill both the mask use. Uh, and then you look at California, they're backing up a little bit in terms of the indoor uh, opportunities for businesses to open up. Uh, so uh, to our what. Uh, individuals out there who are on this broadcast, again, this ain't over. No matter where you're living, it's not over. So be aware of physical distancing, be aware of using masks, uh, be aware of hand washing. Those are the staunch components of, of uh, public health. Uh, and then the issue of large gatherings, right? 
stay away from large gatherings. Next sort of thing that I wanted to update people on, because this is intimately related with some of the research going on uh, in the School of Public Health, and that's the idea that um, we may be dealing with a new uh, phenomenon associated with COVID-19. Uh, until now, our feeling was that transmission had been through larger droplets, therefore the six-foot rule. Uh, so that if I was breathing or talking, that the virus really was forming in these or instilled in these larger droplets and would fall to the ground within the six feet. Uh, one of our professors, researchers, a guy named Don Milton at the School of Public Health, has been doing research for years now. Influenza virus is one of the leaders on, on looking at COVID-19. Uh, and in this past couple of weeks, over 200 researchers, including Don Milton, signed a letter to WHO, the World Health Organization, to acknowledge, to have WHO acknowledge that this may be more than just the bigger droplets. It may be aerosol. And, and that brings up a new public health term talking about airborne spread, right? Uh, and that gets a little bit more serious, which is now, if it's airborne spread, I now have to deal with the idea that it's not just the six-foot rule, that potentially the virus may be spread even further than that, which brings up the issue of mask use as a key component, still a preventive aspect there. So I think that's sort of a brand new news uh, on, on sort of what's been found out. The other aspect that's been found out and sort of publicized in the last uh, 24 to 48 hours, small studies, but our hope had been that maybe individuals who have had the disease will mount a, an immune response and maybe that will protect them. Small study that's uh, coming out of England uh, looks like that people did mount an immune response in the weeks following infection with COVID-19. But then two to three months out, many of them have lost that immune response. Uh, uh, so that's not necessarily great news. Now, could there be other immune responses that happen and protect us? Uh, potentially, because we're only measuring certain immunoglobulins, immuno responses. But the reason I bring that up is that I have to let everybody know this is still a novel coronavirus. It is brand new. And you know, uh, the fact is that every day there's new information coming out about it. The researchers are doing incredible work, including researchers at the School of Public Health. Uh, and we're still working toward this pathway of, of trying to figure out this virus. Research continues on the vaccine front, right? Uh, right now, there's probably four really good vaccine candidates uh, that the U.S. government is supporting, met, supporting many more that are internationally supported. Uh, and, and the hope is that it's not just going to be one vaccine that's going to work. The hope is that there's going to be multiple vaccines that tend to work. We really won't know more until the fall from some of these called, it's called phase three studies for vaccines, where it's given to now thousands of people. And you kind of look at immune response that happens from the vaccine as well as looking for adverse events for uh, things that, you know, uh, may be problematic with the vaccine. So progress is continuing on that front. Progress is also continuing on the front of treatments. Um, you know, the doctors have gotten much better at treating, especially the criti critically ill individuals with COVID-19, so that the mortality rate has decreased overall. The number of fatalities uh, have decreased overall. Part of that is looking at brand new med medicines that are now being used, especially in critically ill people. That includes remdesivir, which is an antiviral. That includes dexamethasone, which is a steroid, has been found to be helpful. That includes new practices where before doctors would put people who were having severe respiratory issues you know, on, on a ventilator. That may not be the right approach. Maybe use of 100% oxygen and being uh, aggressive there may save lives. And even something as simple as positioning of a patient. You know, as a physician, you sometimes think it's all about the drugs. Well, sometimes it's about the practices. And what's been found that, especially for criti critically ill individuals, as opposed to keeping people on their back, putting them on their belly while they're in the ICU allows their lungs to actually work a little bit more efficiently. So those are sort of areas that, you know, often Oftentimes our, our listeners will say, wow, it boils down to that. Sometimes it boils down to that in order to save lives. Uh, again, I remain optimistic, right? I gave you a lot of pessimistic information about the COVID-19 situation. My optimism is we're still learning and each and every time we learn, we react. Uh, and, and that's an important part of what's going on. So that's kind of the update right now, Kelly. 
Yeah, thank you so much for giving us that broad overview, especially touching on all of those different topics. I had no clue about the hospitals and laying on your stomach versus laying on your back. And that's so interesting just to figure out that researchers are finding that out right now. And everything isn't always about the drugs or whatever cutting edge technology. Mm -hmm. It's just simple changes in practice that's already working. Um, yeah. But just going into different things and how it relates to UMD, I know there's a lot of people on here and I just want to make sure that everybody knows, like, please feel free to comment any questions or anything that you might have for Dean Lushniak about UMD or coronavirus or anything so we could answer them in time too. Um, but we do- I also want to welcome Kelly right now. I just want to welcome too. Yeah. I know we, I think, sent invites to some of our new incoming students, graduate students, maybe some undergrads as well. So we may have new Terps uh, on the line as well. So welcome to those graduate students or undergrads who may be on here. That's so exciting. Oh, congrats, Terps. Um, but just going into it, so I guess everyone's gotten this email. Um, if you're a student or going to be a student at the University of Maryland about um, just what we're planning to do in the fall. And the email included something about adequate testing. So honestly, I was just curious, what does that exactly mean? And then also, have there been any like models for testing that we've seen to like handle a mass influx of people to one area? Yeah, so the testing situation, that continues to unfold. Uh, we're still sort of designing what it's gonna look like for people returning in the fall, what are gonna be sort of the recommendations and, and are, is there gonna be a mandatory component to that for people to be pre-tested prior to returning? That's all still a bit being worked. What's happened to date, we've actually had what now amounts to three different rounds of testing on campus. So those of you who have not been around haven't seen this. I actually participated in the first and third round, not only as an observer, but also had a swab inserted into my nose and uh, sort of felt what it would feel like. So uh, first round was uh, early in June. Uh, and I think at that point we had a little over 250 people tested. And, and that included, this was open to faculty, to staff, and some of the returning students, particularly the student athletes, some of whom were returning to the sort of begin some of their uh, conditioning exercises, right? And conditioning programs for student athletics. Uh, that first round in June, uh, and to remind you what the test consists of, and this was all done at the stadium, at the football stadium, um, well organized in an outdoor environment, cordoned off areas. You were pre-registered prior, so they knew you were coming. Uh, and then uh, a very sort of meticulous process of making sure that you were registered appropriately, that you were quick, quickly taken to a private area, uh, a healthcare professional. In this case, uh, the first round was, was nurses, nurse interns or externs. Uh, and uh, it's, it was a simple procedure in that ultimately a swab, sort of a big Q-tip, if you will, inserted into both parts of your nose, sort of the nares on the right side, the nares on the left side. Uh, I've heard about two different ways of doing this test that were done here. There's actually three ways you can do it. And, and now I experienced two out of the three. The simplest is called the anterior nares test, which is in essence a Q-tip inserted just into the nose area swab for 20 seconds on one side, swab for 20 seconds on the other side, put it into a, a tube, and then, then that's cordoned, taken off to the University of Maryland School of Medicine and results are run there. The other test, which I underwent yesterday, which is a little bit more uncomfortable, but not terribly so, uh, is called the nasopharyngeal. the throat. Sounds kind of gross. Uh, was a more uncomfortable, I'll be honest, but that's done on both sides as well. And then that same thing has taken place. There's an intermediate one that I don't think we've been doing. It's called the mid-turbinate, which is now inserted halfway through the nose, sort of into this area. But the key is to be able to find, um, you know, uh, the right samples. And the sample really is, you know, can this be done with spit? We've seen some uh, the schools going the spit route. Again, this is all evolving to trying to figure out where can we get the best information. So now we've had several rounds. First round, 250 people, there were no positives. Uh, second round was done with athletics uh, last week and, and there was a press release that came out on this. And, and what happened there was I think 190 or people or so, don't quote me on the numbers, I thought I had the press release here. Let's see if I have it. 
but uh, we had nine positives. Uh, so nine people in athletics, uh, student athletes, as well as staff that were tested positive at that point. So those were our first round of, of positives in, in our uh, report uh, or in our, our testing program. Uh, and, and now this week, uh, yesterday, and I think today, uh, uh, was another round of testings, again, for faculty and staff who are working on campus. Uh, I'm not sure what the numbers were. I was told yesterday morning was really busy. I was there yesterday afternoon. It was less busy. I think we had the capabilities, you know, talking about it has how many people can we do at once. Uh, the advertised capabilities for these two days was that we can handle up to 2,000 people, right, to be tested uh, right there at the football stadium, quickly in and out, and that Ultimately, we were told that results would be available in a few days uh, and that we would then be informed as to whether we're positive or negative. The key feature here, and this is important, no matter whatever testing regimen we have, is what do you do about that testing, right? It's one thing to be tested. It's another aspect, and nationwide we're having problems with this, is the turnaround between having the test and having the result. Uh, I heard in one case that was advertised on the press, 27 days it took for a person to get their results. Well, you know, for this disease, that's un, you know, unbelievable. That's really bad. But even if you get up to six to eight days, what are you going to do for those six and eight days as you're waiting around? Am I positive? Am I negative? What else should I be doing? Here, I think for the most part, I think I got my test result on the first round within two to three days. That's at least more reasonable. We would love to have, and, and there are, are some developments in, in sort of the world of research again, to have the rapid test. You get it right there. We're still not there. And the hope is as it, these testing regimens evolve that will implement what's going to be hopefully the easiest and the quickest turnaround at the University of Maryland. But at least we've had these experiences these last few weeks of how do you implement a testing regimen, right, for large numbers of people. So it's, it's a movement that's undergoing. And again, each and every time the team that's out there doing this learns from this and we get better at it. Yeah, I didn't know that we had those different waves of testing. That's really cool that the university like sponsored that. Um, one question that was just submitted is from Joanne and she said it might be a little bit early to say, but with the way things are going, does it look like the spring semester will be online? Oh boy, it's so hard to predict. You know, what's really bizarre about this is that, you know, even the modelers, right? What we try to do, you know, the modelers and, and a great group to look at is the University of Washington has a great modeling team. Uh, if you look at their website, um, you know, modeling is only as good as the data that goes in to try to produce that model. Um, I'll bring up something again, you know, maybe I'm being a little too negative in the midst of all this, but I'm, I'm quoting, you know, sort of what the Dr. Redfield, who's the head of CDC uh, from the University of Maryland uh, School of Medicine, who's now serving in that role, uh, said yesterday. And he said, yes, something that was repeated uh, or initially said a few weeks ago, which is we're bracing ourselves for a bad fall in winter. And part of this is that we know every year influenza returns, that's a seasonal pattern. And the feeling is that this COVID-19 won't be gone by the fall and winter. So if we hit a double whammy, that may be bad. It's difficult to predict what's gonna be happening in, in, in the spring. And to a large extent, it almost is difficult to predict, in fact, what's gonna happen in the fall, right? So right now we have plans at the university and the plans are, and you know, you already know this, especially the students out there and our income students have to realize this as well, right? And this is not novel, this isn't brand new information. Brace yourself. It's not a normal school year come August 31st. It is not, right? Uh, we just can't do a normal school year under this circumstance. Um, you know, when we look at what we're trying to do at, at Maryland, and, and, you know, there's a framework called For Maryland, and the number for Maryland. That's sort of the, the sort of the big push about how we're trying to prepare for COVID-19. And I'm going to give you that framework because this is important of how it plays a role in terms of the school year ahead. Number one of that foursome is prioritize the health and safety of every member of our campus community. So health and safety is critical. Decisions need to be made. We're trying to get some students back on campus, yes, into residence halls. We're trying to get some students back into the classroom with very strict stipulations. Uh, and, and that's a key feature, though, is the health and safety. 
Uh, we also try to, you know, to do number two on this list, protect and support the educational and research missions to maintain academic excellence. Three, to make the decisions that are grounded in our values of equity and inclusion. And four, to provide timely and transparent communications and obtain input, right, from internal, external stakeholders about the proposed reopening plans. Uh, and one can argue, you know, any time in the midst of crisis, the idea of, you know, of, of, of communication, transparent communication, uh, I know we're getting a lot of complaints that you're not getting enough information at the right time and things are vague. Um, you know, I'm not here to make up excuses for that. The reality is that this is a changing landscape. And if we're putting health and safety first, it's very difficult in the midst of all the things I just told you to commit to exactly what's going to be taking place in the fall. But the commitment right now still remains, right? Uh, I think the numbers are trying to get up to 20% of undergraduate classes, um, at least in some aspect of, of being in person or in a hybrid model, 20%. We're talking about residence halls, perhaps occupancy up to 75%, perhaps 80%. But the idea is, don't forget, as we're designing all these things, I have to think about physical distancing. How do I keep people away from each other in the classrooms and in the residence halls? And how do I deal with the use of masks? Is that, you know, how is that gonna be done in all those settings? So, you know, uh, there's a lot of movement right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of my friends actually told me this this morning that we could check on Testudo to see which of our classes are online or face-to-face -face. and I think four out of five of my classes are online and then one will be face to face in the fall, which is just like interesting for all students to just check test tutor to see what you're registered for. Um, yeah, I know that information that. was supposed to be coming out and it's interesting, you fall right in that realm of statistics, right? Cause pretty much 20% of your classes are. Yeah, But you exactly. know, and, and, and you know, it, it's just, this is really a difficult decision process, right? And I know that the online experience is different than the in-person experience. But, you know, as a health and safety guy, I can't just say, okay, let's pretend all this isn't happening, right? I just, I can't say that. I can't say, oh, we're just gonna gamble on this. Like, let's open up everything and we'll see what happens. Uh, this is dangerous to be sort of, you know, that, uh, that aggressive. Mm -hmm. And then for the 20% of classes that will be in person, Will the university be providing like masks and hand sanitizer and things to clean off desks like for all that are on campus? So, yeah, so several things are being done. First of all, let's talk about the classrooms themselves. So we have a whole team that's been looking at the ventilation of, of classrooms. Uh, and, and the whole issue here is really one of, to large extent, fresh air is good for you, right? So, you know, outdoors is better than indoors. Obviously, a lot of our classes are indoors, although we've been asking people to think about the whole idea of the outdoor setting as well for classes. So uh, the, you know, um, the reality is that, you know, classroom buildings have been evaluated and looking at the idea that they meet sort of the, the standards that are out there uh, set by a group called the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating and Air Conditioning Engineers, ASHRAE is the group. Uh, so the idea of the classrooms, you know, any classroom that looks like it's not going to be good um, and in and, and reality, uh, you know, that classroom should be taken offline, right? And that's what our engineers, our, our group of people who are doing sort of the, the heating and ventilation systems are looking at right now. Idea of classrooms is that, you know, cleaning will be taking place, disinfecting will be taking place on a more regular basis to be determined how all that is happening. But there's going to be this idea of hygiene in the classroom. That's going to be, uh, you know, and, and classrooms will be equipped with disinfectant wipes for students to clean your own surfaces, such as seats, desks, and tables between each class if necessary. So you want to do sort of to make sure it's going to be a lot like what people are doing on airplanes right now, right? A lot of people are going on airplanes wearing a mask and then they bring their disinfectant wipes and they wipe everything down. Uh, we'll have those wipes available in the classroom so that you can feel assured that you actually did your cleaning, right? Because it's almost impossible to make sure that everything is cleaned the minute after the last student left. So there's some aspect of personal responsibility. 
I think we're looking at this idea, and, and I'm not sure if it's been fully developed, of issuing masks to faculty and staff and students, some of the cloth masks that are out there, so that everybody has a mask, uh, or it's a bring your own scenario as well. But mask use is going to be highly you know, enforced and recommended on, on the campus environment. Yeah, I went to the School of Public Health yesterday, right? And, and um, it's interesting how we're already set up there. So what are you gonna notice difference about the school? As soon as you enter through the front uh, doors is a big you know, information signs, information postings about COVID-19. So the idea is that health information is being given to you. Is everybody gonna sit there and read it? I don't know. But it's important for at least the first time, read up on what we're trying to do. There's also a big disinfectant, you know, uh, hand sanitizing machine right at the entranceway. Entrances are marked and there's, there's arrows on, on the ground saying, here's how you enter the School of Public Health building and here's how you exit. The idea of having two separate pathways is important. As soon as you enter, there's markings on the pathway as you're going in to remind you of the six foot distance from one person to another. So is it gonna be kind of weird? It's gonna be kind of weird. It's not gonna be sort of the mass of students coming in, but I'm asking you, you have to be part of the plan here, right, to be able to do that. So, you know, when you look at that, and, and we even moved our furniture, let's say in, on the main floor where a lot of students congregate mm -hmm. to make sure that these areas are separated by at least six feet, right, in that realm. So, uh, you know, that's but an example of how we're looking at changing our own, you know, and there's many other examples, but how we're changing the classroom environment. Uh, people will be spaced in classrooms, which is why we're really limiting uh, sort of the, the in-person options to relatively small class sizes, 50 or less. Um, you know, uh, the bigger classes obviously won't be taking place in person because you can't possibly do that six foot distance and, you know, uh, easily. So uh, there's a lot of kind of preparation going on of how we follow the public health recommendations in light of having some people coming back. Yeah, thank you. And just going off of that, um, we had a question related to this. Um, and the question was, why are labs and classes with less than 30 people online when it was stated classes less than 50 would be in person? Uh, so again, there's, there's several things. What we needed to prioritize here is, and this is sort of the first aspect of this, uh, of sort of planning for which classes are, is which classes absolutely need to be in person, right? Uh, we realize that everybody would love, I think everybody would love to have all their classes in person. You have the, you know, the interaction with other students, you have that interaction with your faculty member, you have the exchange of, of knowledgeable information face to face. As I mentioned, the standard, this is not going to be a standard school year, so that's not going to happen. One of the things we have to realize is that there are certain classes that possi can't possibly take place online. And some of them are the lab courses, right, where you need to have equipment, where you need to, to sort of go through a laboratory procedures. In other schools, the music classes, right, some of them where you're performing with others around you. So we have to look first at, at sort of the idea of which classes are applicable to being and can only take place in person. Um, so that was sort of one of the first rounds. Larger classes over the size of 50 all went, you know, online right off the bat or perhaps had, you know, sort of groups uh, sessions that were potentially in person introduced into there. There's going to be certain modifications potentially in terms of a hybrid for some of these. But it really goes down to idea. First, you have to do the, the, the in-person ones, which are, you know, will I still be able to teach something online versus I can't do it online? And that was the first round. Mm -hmm. So uh, to a large extent, it was that. To a large extent, we also had to look at, you know, we need to, and you'll hear this term a lot, is it, it's about density on campus, right? So it's the whole idea. We're trying to, to make, decrease the density in the residence halls. We're trying to decrease the density of students in the classroom. And we're trying to decrease the, the density of faculty and staff that need to be on campus because this goes all the way through, right? You look at from a student's perspective, and I look at that from that perspective as well as a dean. 
but I also have staff and I also have researchers and I also have faculty and they have offices and I can't possibly have all my faculty and staff in the building at the same time because I'm following the same rules. So part of this was trying to figure out how do we align those classes with the number of professors and, and other teachers who are on, on campus, with the number of staff that need to be able to serve. And, and so once again, this is, you know, this isn't <laughs> very easy to sort of calculate this out. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that's sort of a back of the napkin way of some of the decisions that were taking place about which classes are going where. Yeah, and then also a question we got was, um, if you don't feel comfortable being in a classroom, like say if you had a class in person, um, would you be penalized for not being in that classroom setting? You know, I, I don't know how we're looking at it from the student affairs aspect. I would go back to the mm -hmm. website to look at those things. When I looked at the website early today, it basically talked about the idea that if at all possible, if the class is, you know, is an in-person only class and you feel you can't do it, uh, it may be better to find alternative classes, if at all possible, the online classes, because, again, some of those classes are going to be very difficult, right? To do an organic mm -hmm. lab, you know, if those are going to be offered, I haven't tech checked the pseudo, but I'm using that example. And again, it's not based out of the School of Public Health, but an organic lab denotes that you have to be there in person. And as a, you know, as a teacher, if I were a teacher of organic chemistry lab, how can I evaluate you or teach you adequately if you're not there? So it may not be a perfect match for you to take it at this time if, if that's, you know, where, 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 you know, your thought process is heading. And then I guess just going back onto like the on-campus experience, could you be able to talk a little bit about different research that might be transferable to our on-campus experience? For example, like what science shows us about living in residence halls or sharing communal bathrooms or showers and how the university could potentially incorporate these practices into our plans? Yeah, I mean, that's a big thing. And, and you know, I'm, I'm co-chair of our health safety and risk mitigation task force at the university. And that's a big question. We actually had a great meeting yesterday uh, with uh, President Pines and with some of the vice presidents to talk about this density issue. Uh, what we're looking at is that, you know, let's first talk about the residence halls and how sort of change of practice is there, is that in general, and, you know, what we're looking at is depending on how much room there is, you know, is limiting, you know, the number of people per, uh, per sort of uh, room setting, right? So uh, quads and triples are turning into doubles, so there's hopefully another space. FYI, organic two labs are online as of this morning. So maybe that was a bad example. Uh, but um, the, uh, the issue of density is really a big issue. So how do you de-densify things, right, in, in terms of uh, that, that setting? So right now they're looking at occupancy being limited in the dorms, and, and that may even change with time. Uh, you know, um, uh, we, we can't possibly have 100% filled, right, in the dorms. That's not going to work. Because now you have the issue of not only how many people are in the room, but also the use of, you know, the bathroom facilities, right? How are we going to do that? And, and to some extent, you know, the bathroom is, again, another place where people, you know, the old fashioned way is you go there, you kind of find your shower stall, you do whatever, you know, need to get done. And it doesn't matter who else is in there, right? Uh, this, again, may have to sort of have new practices where there'll be a limitation of number of people in a bathroom setting. Uh, the uh, the issue of dining halls, the same thing, the whole idea of just congregating and sitting together in a group and having your meal together. There's going to have to be spacing and it will be encouraged to do the take and go model of food uh, uh, sort of distribution. So when you look at, you know, the research, the big feature here are twofold, one of which is ventilation. Can I make sure that somehow I'm getting fresh air into the setting? And then secondly is going to be density of individuals, how I, do I limit the number of people? And this includes even activities at STAMP, right? STAMP is not going to be just sort of open, right? Like it in the old days, there are going to be limitations. So, uh, so that's an important factor. And the third sort of research that's out there is what works in terms of prevention. And again, the mask wear is a key feature, right? Uh, you know, and we're a culture that's only now getting used to the idea of wearing masks, right? I mean, if I had told you back in December that we would have all these people walking around wearing masks in, in, in the grocery store, 
you would have said, oh, that doesn't happen here, right? It's happening here and the data show that it does work. So uh, that's gotta be a key feature in terms of us being very disciplined when it comes to that. So, you know, research is out there of what works, what doesn't work, and we're trying to always modify as we find new research. I mean, the, the information I presented to you about the issue of aerosols and airborne spread, we're still sort of just analyzing that. But, you know, there's, there's you know, we have to react to that. We can't just ignore it. Mm -hmm. And then going off of different buildings on campus and like just SAMP in general, uh, someone asked a question if buildings would be open to students who don't have face-to-face -face classes there and just want to study. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, and a good example is going to be like even the library setting, right, is what's going to be happening mm -hmm. there. And, and the libraries are actually really good at, at this. I mean, they're setting it up so that students can use the library. Uh, but once again, it's not going to be your old fashioned library. So, you know, the whole idea of the study groups may be altered and modified. You may have to sort of have that space between the each, within each other. So my hope is that, you know, when it comes to the campus experience, once again, I'm going to say, tell you where I started with, it's not going to be a normal school year. And if that's your expectation, that you're going to come back and it's going to be August 31st from last year, 0% chance of that. But will there be, right, some, you know, activity, some, you know, student magic taking place? Will there be this idea? Yeah, but with all these modifications that I just mentioned, right? It's going to be different, mm -hmm. folks. Yeah, and then going off of, like, different events and fun things that students can look forward to, um, someone submitted a question saying, well, asking just if large groups like ROTC with 100 or more people would still be able to have events in person with social distance measures, or would they have to adhere to whatever the university deems as appropriate? Yeah, I mean, we'll, you will be issuing sort of guidance on large group gatherings in terms of the number of people allowed to gather. Mm -hmm. Right now, I think we're, you know, and the reality is I'll have to mention that we don't stand as an island as a university. One is, I'll remind you, and everybody knows this, this isn't just an outbreak mm -hmm. of disease and a pandemic that's taken place on the university campus, right? Uh, it's worldwide, and it also affects our local community. That's College Park and the county, Prince George's County. So we'll have to be adhering to whatever phase and recommendations that the county gives us. So the county health officer, and, and they're working very closely with a lot of our, our teams uh, you know, as is the city of College Park, is we have to follow whatever the governor has told the counties to do or whatever the counties mm -hmm. are telling their citizens to do. We are citizens of that county. So when it comes to large group gatherings, I think right now uh, our counties around here are at the maximum size of 50, 5 zero. Um, that's up from 10, which was, I think, initially. Uh, where we'll be at in, in August and into the mm -hmm. summertime, really, or into the fall, really depends on where this, this pandemic goes locally, right? If we continue to uh, down the pathway of decreasing number of cases, that's the hope, uh, then we'll be able to open up larger activities uh, judiciously. Uh, but again, go in expecting that, you know, these large group activities won't be taking place. And it's really cool to see how like health is so interconnected within the county and within the university and the city. Um, and another thing that people do think about is contact tracing because it is such a big component to prevent transmission of the virus. Um, so what role does UMD envision for contact tracing or like have, has there been any talk with different local health departments nearby? Right. So the key feature is going to be sort of our relationship with Prince George's County. So several good things on, on this front is Prince George's County has a, a contact tracing system in place. Uh, they've been at it now for several months. And, and we, as part of that community, will fall into their contact tracing scheme. Uh, we're also looking at a model that I don't have full information on right now. Uh, but that there will be, and we can't necessarily use the term contact tracings. We don't want to confuse it with what's going on at the jurisdictional level, which is the public health authorities at the county or at the state. Uh, but there's uh, going to be uh, an arrangement with the University Health Center and the School of Public Health to make sure that we get in early with any people who test positive, right, on our campus. 
so that the problem with contact tracing nationwide uh, is that, as I mentioned earlier, the gap between having a test and having a positive is one gap. And we're trying to keep that as short as possible. The other gap is between being a positive, knowing about it, right? Hopefully that happens, you know, rather quickly where somebody is able to tell you, here's what I should be doing. The next gap is the gap. One, a lot of work and saying, okay, you tested positive. Who have you been in contact with, right, in the last 14 days so that we can inform them that they are at higher risk? What we're trying to do by having this system built mm -hmm. into uh, this arrangement between the University Health Center and the School of Public Health is that, um, that that will start earlier. So the minute that the university finds out about a positive, we still have to give the information to the county because we're part of that mm -hmm. jurisdiction. And sometime in the next few days, hopefully a shorter time period, the county will contact you. But we'll already provide, get some initial information, finding out who have you been in contact with on campus and what can we do about it. And the key here from a public health aspect is every single contact needs to be co connected with. And somebody needs to speak with them saying, hey, listen, by the way, you've been in contact with somebody who is now a positive and our recommendations are, right? You need to probably mm -hmm. get tested right now. And secondly, watch out for your symptoms right now. And thirdly, think about, you know, quarantining yourself away from others because you may be at higher risk until we get your results back. So, you know, there, there is a system that we're trying to build in here. Let me also tell you about other things that are going on on campus even now. So every day I get an email, right? And the email asks me, uh, Boris, are you coming to campus today? And I answer, yes or no. If it's yes, I'm being asked right off the bat, do I have any of the following symptoms, all consistent with the diagnosis of COVID-19? If I answer no to everything, then the answer is, okay, you can come on campus. Now it sounds to, to everybody like, oh, this is a silly system because we know there's a lot of asymptomatics. Well, again, it's part of the puzzle. Right. So the reality is that, you know, in general, most students are going to be prompted on a daily basis. You know, we're testing the system out right now saying, how do you feel today? And if you don't, if you answer yes to any of the questions, you'll be given information of who to call at the University Health Center. And you may get tested at that point based upon those symptoms. Right. So there's there's multiple sort of facets to this. None of them individually are perfect, nor is the combination of all these preventive measures perfect. But the combination works better than the individual aspects and works better than nothing at this point. That's so true. And then would, do you think that this could be an opportunity for public health students or some other students to collaborate with um, in regards to tracing or just helping out? Like, I feel like this is such a cool current event happening right now. And if we could twist this for like an educational moment, this would be really interesting. Right, and we started that uh, at the end of the, the, the academic year last year and then continued for some students into the summertime, which, which as volunteers, they were assigned to the Department of Health at the uh, Prince George's County level. And so, you know, uh, again, the county can't handle mm -hmm. a huge number of students. The problem is if this was all done remotely, this would have been great. The, the drag of this was that our students actually had to go to the Prince George's County sort of their contact tracing center. And part of this was, you know, confidentiality, was who, you know, who has the information. You know, there, there's a lot of privacy issues that are taking place. It all started also with a system that was very paper oriented, right? Uh, and then, you know, it's gotten more computerized over time. But our students have been involved and our hope is that we continue this relationship. We met the School of Public Health and some of our faculty are meeting with the Prince George's County health leaders. Uh, I think it, it works out almost every week and a half, every two weeks to discuss not only collaboration between the School of Public Health, but the introduction of student activities into this. Because you're absolutely right. I mean, this is, this is learning on the job. This is, you know, seeing a real pandemic unfold before your very eyes. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And then, um, we just got a few questions submitted. One was about, um, William said that he, 
thought that McKeldin would be closed until January with only curbside pickup. And then he was just wondering if this was no longer true. Yeah, I'll have to check. I saw that comment. I, you know, uh, again, I don't necessarily have the updated information that, and forgive me for that. So, you know, keep monitoring what's going on. And this is really important for all our students, right? Is that the latest information will come in, in two forms, right? One form is an email. So do not neglect your emails that's coming from the university. That'll give you a heads up of any new communications. But at the same time, and I just did this an hour ago, right? You Google UMD COVID and, and it gets you to the sites with all the latest information. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm not sure if the libraries have been updating their information. Uh, you may be right, William, uh, on this, but you know, um, again, these things are changing all the time based upon the parameters that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Sophie submitted a question asking um, what kind of impact did COVID and online classes have on the behavioral and community health spring internship program? And what are we preparing yeah. for it to look like again this upcoming spring? Well, again, you know, we're, you know, when we look at, you know, BCH in particular, behavioral and community health, and the important aspect is, you know, they have a, a full you know, 40 credit hours or whatever of an internship program that's critical to, to succeeding in that the degree path. And this is an exciting time uh, for the student to have that real life experience. Right now, it all depends on who uh, is the sponsor of that internship program and whether they're, first of all, working on site. Many are not. Uh, we try to do as many as sort of an online internship. And once again, I realize, you know, it's not as good as being there in person, right? It's not, uh, but it all depends on the groups that we're doing the internships with and spring is still to be determined. Uh, my hope is that somehow by the spring, things will be changed and, you know, and this is my hope. This is Lushniak's aspirational model, which I'm sure is all of yours aspirational model that come, you know, January of 2021 and we're ready to start the new semester that we're back to normal. Um, is that going to happen uh, right now? It doesn't look like it's going to be completely normal, but can I get to a sense of, you know, new ways of, of looking at the world and you, you know, new approaches to internships? Yes. Let's look at a success story and the success story right now, I, I, I shared with you the European Union model, right? The information of how we're different and not doing as well. But if you look at Europe, there was a famous, you know, a popular uh, chart that came out, a graph that came out just a few weeks ago. Look this up, EU versus USA COVID. And what it shows you is exactly what I showed you, uh, mm -hmm. drawn for you, right? Europe has come down, America, USA has sort of come down and then leveled off and is going up again. The European model is what we want, right? That's what we want because what's happening in Europe is things are now at a phase where there still is disease, it's not zero. And that's where we're hopefully, you know, that's, you know, that's realistically, not hopefully, where we're gonna be at in January is that disease won't be zero. But if we can sort of bring it down to the European formula, if you will, then what we'll have is more opportunities open for things, right? So schools have been reopened, right, in Europe. Occasionally you're getting people with positives. Occasionally you have to do short-term closures. But because you've now limited to the disease in the community, you're able to react much more vibrantly to those outbreaks. More mm -hmm. businesses are opening, including, let's say, internship opportunities where they're taking people in person now for internships in Europe, right? Because they're open. That's where I would like us to, to, to be become January, right? If we can only do what Europe did, then um, it would not make this go away, but it'd make things a, a little bit more normal. Thank you so much for giving that insight. Um, and I, I, just looking at the time, this hour always flies by so quickly. But um, thank you so much, Dean Lushniak, for answering and fielding all of our questions. And then also everybody who's watching this for submitting questions and just listening in. Um, if Dean Lushniak, if you have any closing remarks. Yeah, so let me tell you about, you know, on top of COVID-19, what else mm -hmm. have we experienced, right? And, you know, when I did the updates, I did strictly on COVID-19, you know, the issues of our society in general, right? A lot of tumultuous times, a lot of self-reflection, a lot of revelations. 
And, and when it comes to this, I, I can't you know, neglect the idea of systemic racism and how it's affected our society. How does it affect public health? Well, racism is a public health issue. The murder of Joy, George Floyd was just, you know, uh, a, a unfortunately another example, one that enraged many people, but another example of where we have b big societal problems. I want our students to engage in, in, in racism as a public health issue. And there is a webinar. Diversity and Inclusion, Office of Diversity and Inclusion, ODI at the university. There's a webinar that we, the School of Public Health, are co-sponsoring. That's tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Get the information and get engaged in this other major public health issue, right? So let's not neglect that. And again, 2 o'clock tomorrow, get the information either at the University of Maryland School of Public Health web, uh, uh, Facebook site, uh, or um, uh, the UMD site for diversity and inclusion. And, and so get engaged in that. And, and that's just this important a battle that we're waging. And we got to get better at that. So thank, thank you, you, Kelly. So much Thanks for, for being a great host again. Um, yeah, of course. No, of course. And I just put the link um, for the teaching in the chat. So if anybody wants to just use that or save that, definitely feel free. And I hope you all have a great rest of your Wednesday. Great. See ya. Thanks, Kelly.